today, man looks out farther into the universe than ever before and hunts the tiniest subatomic particles using technologies barely envisioned even a few short years ago. Driven by the need to understand the world around us and how we fit in, we create the machines that allow us to continue exploration with the hope that someday we may unlock the answers to the really big questions. The question that I think appeals to the average person, not just the specialist, is one of origins. We know that people haven't been here forever. We presumably evolved from some other more primitive life form and that from something more primitive. But there also was a time before which there was no life at all and before that, no planets. Where did it all come from? That's, that's the fascinating question. Well, in some sense, the universe as we know it originated in the Big Bang, but that was a partial creation. It only made the lightest elements. There would be no planets like Earth and no life if it weren't for the action of the stars and the nuclear reactions there. So when we study the stars, we're studying our own history. We're studying ourselves. If you would reduce it to the basics, um, the question that we're all interested in is why are we here? How did we get here? What are we made of? Um, that's not the way we phrase the question. We usually phrase it a tiny little bit about the drip line or uh, what is the full extent of the periodic table. But at the end of the day, uh, we're trying to find our cosmic history. We're trying to connect ourselves to the quark soup that was there at the beginning. But how far do we go and at what cost? What are the implications of abandoning exploration and frontier science? And what are the rewards for moving forward in these fields? If the cost of science exploration is higher than ever, the stakes are also higher as we continue to examine the small matter of big science. If you go back several hundred years and you look at what nations valued, not all nations, just the nations that were wealthy enough to explore, they were interested in finding other lands, other resources, some acquired by trade, peaceful methods, others not so peaceful. But at the end of the day, what mattered was that a nation's understanding of its place in the larger world grew. And that is not something all nations have the luxury of partaking in. In modern times, of course, the entire world is mapped. So exploration is not so much, is there a new land we've never seen before? Exploration now can be thought of as the search for ideas. When you're not actually advancing a space frontier, of course, the universe is large. Many, many shores await our discovery in the cosmos, but combine that with the fact that today, for me, the biggest frontier is the frontier of knowledge, the frontier of understanding how the universe works. And the nations that embark on these epic adventures of discovery are those who gain great economic wealth from those discoveries. They gain an important um, uh, sense of security and those are nations that get remembered throughout all of time. As we look out over the next generation or two, I, you know, I think it's pretty clear that frontier science is going to be absolutely a major factor in shaping the world. Uh, our growing understanding 
of biological systems, of materials, our growing ability to analyze data, helped in part by the developments in basic particle and nuclear science. All of those are going to be very important in shaping our understanding of the world and how we can manage human affairs. The game changers, the things that change the rules of the game that take us from the industrial age to the information age come from basic research. And my favorite example is quantum mechanics. I, I can only imagine if you had to uh, go and justify why you were studying quantum mechanics in the 1920s, that uh, it would be an absolute disaster. Uh, I believe that in the 1920s, quantum mechanics was more mysterious than uh, string theory is today, and there was less of an appreciation. Yet today, uh, I'll just throw a number out there, that 40% of our GDP derives from quantum mechanics. And why do I say that? We live in the information age, so where do we create information? With quantum devices. Where do we store it? With quantum devices. How do we transmit it? With quantum devices. How do we manipulate it? With quantum devices. The information age would simply not be possible without quantum mechanics. And so I call that a game changer because it took us from the industrial age to the information age. And what that next game changer is going to be, we don't have the slightest idea. Uh, but we know, based on history, that there will be a game changer, and it will come from basic research. And, you know, 50 years from now, 30 years from now, 100 years from now, uh, people will say, thank goodness they invested in basic research because otherwise we wouldn't be here where we are now. There is what I would call a whole science and technology enterprise. It starts from the very basic discovery science, simply trying to find out about the natural world. It then extends to, well, how can we start to think about applying those phenomena to do things that are useful to us? And then the whole technology discussion of how can we then take that application and build it into useful systems. We need the whole continuum. If we stop discovering things, we will not have the technologies that we'll need in the next several decades. We live in exciting times. Sometimes that's not so good, but for this purpose, it's great. Three things are coming together. Uh, observations, we're coming to have some of the largest telescopes with the highest resolution and the greatest penetrating power that we've ever had. We can survey the heavens at all wavelengths. We can look across the universe. We can see stars of all masses and all ages and measure their composition with incredible precision. And at the same time, our ability to model, to simulate, to build replicas of stars and galaxies on computers is, has been increasing exponentially for decades, but now it's hit a threshold where we can with almost complete realism from first principles simulate the life and death of a star. We can do the three-dimensional calculation with all of the, the hydrodynamics and nuclear reactions and everything folded in. So that's two pieces of the puzzle, but the third piece is the laboratory data, the information that binds us to reality, the, the cross-sections, the half-lives, the natures of all of the isotopes that make up all of the elements that give the energy generation for the stars that provide the building blocks of nucleosynthesis. And so laboratory facilities for that purpose are also being constructed, and these three things are coming together so that the next decade is really going to be golden. If America, if we're not the ones who find the solutions to the problems that face humanity today, other developing and developed countries are, in fact, investing huge resources, intellectual and financial capital, to find these solutions. And out of those solutions come products and patents and this sort of thing. So we, we may benefit from their innovations uh, because we'll be part of a society that's been saved by them, but we will not benefit economically from it. In 2008, the U.S. Department of Energy announced its plans to invest in a new facility for rare isotope beams. EFRIB is a joint product between the Department of Energy, Michigan State University, and built on a foundation that was laid at NSCL over many decades uh, by the National Science Foundation. Uh, it is fundamentally a facility to produce beams of rare nuclei nuclei that may not be abundant in nature but might be stable, and also nuclei that might have short lifetimes 
and hence have to be manufactured immediately before they get accelerated. Using beams like that, together with the right targets and instrumentation, we can basically start to explore vast unexplored regions of the periodic chart. Uh, we don't know exactly what we're going to find when we go out exploring like this, but they could have implications not only for our understanding of the universe, our understanding of how the elements of which we're composed are made, but also perhaps important technological problems through their radiative decays or through perhaps uh, if they live long enough we could start to make materials out of them. EFRIP will be the ultimate discovery machine. It will be the best facility to conduct rare isotope research, which means producing, discovering, and studying new species of atomic nuclei which do exist in the cosmos but which don't exist on Earth, and opening them up to scientific inquiry. It will be more than a factor of thousands, sometimes a factor of 10,000 more powerful than anything we have in the United States to conduct this research with. With EFRIP being the most powerful rare isotope accelerator at a beam power of 400 kilowatts, we will be either able to do experiments in shorter time than any place else, or we will be able to do experiments that can't be done any place else, because in the end, no facility can dedicate a year's worth of beam time to one particular scientific question. The users are scientists who do experiments and they make inquiries about nature and they could be making inquiries about the structure of atomic nuclei. They can learn about how the elements are made in stars or they can learn about fundamental symmetries in nature or how rare isotopes can serve society. And at Michigan State we are designing and establishing this facility to support the nuclear physics directorate's mission in the Office of Science in the Department of Energy and we will provide this facility in about a decade and then users from all over the world will come and do their studies here. For the United States to maintain its position as an international economic force, it must invest in science and technology. The facility for rare isotope beams at Michigan State University is a prime example of the type of infrastructure necessary for America to continue being a powerhouse in the global economy. Only a sustained effort by the private and the public sector to commit to research and education will allow America and Michigan to compete for quality jobs of the future.